Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ISIS book discussion on the publication, More Than the Eyes Can See, Memoirs of Gopinath Pillay. This book discussion is held as a hybrid session. It is being live streamed on the ISIS Facebook page. We are pleased to announce that the publisher, World Scientific Publishing, is offering a special discount for Ambassador Pillay's memoir today. The hardcover is priced at $50 net, while the paperback copy is available at $30 net. If you have not gotten your copy yet, you may do so at the publisher's booth in the foyer. You may also place bulk orders. A very good afternoon, distinguished panelists, excellencies, Ambassador Gopinath Pillay's family, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kundavi, and I'm pleased to be your MC today. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, I welcome you to the ISIS book discussion titled, More Than the Eye Can See, Memoirs of Gopinath Pillay. Singapore's Emeritus Senior Minister, Go Chok Tong, officially launched the book at a small and private function in NUS last Saturday. The publication is co-authored by Ambassador Pillay and Mr. John Butter, a former research associate at ISIS. It is published by World Scientific Publishing. ISIS was delighted to organize the book launch. We are also pleased to host today's book discussion. Ambassador Pillay is the founding chairman of ISIS and currently senior advisor to the Institute. To start the proceedings, I would like to invite Mr. John Butter, co-author of the publication, to deliver, to deliver the welcome remarks. Mr. Butter, please. Former Foreign Affairs Minister, Mr. George Yeo, Ambassador at Large, Professor Tommy Ko, ISAS Chairman, Professor Tan Tai Yong, Mr. Tarun Das, former Director General, Confederation of Indian Industry, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Good afternoon. My name is John Botter, co author of the book. I am privileged with delivering the welcome remarks. Mr. Pillay and I began collaborating on his memoirs after I first met him as a research associate at the Institute of South Asian Studies in 2019. We started interviewing for them roughly two years ago. As some are aware, Emeritus Senior Minister Go Chok Tong launched the book in a private ceremony last Saturday. That launch marks the beginning of what I also hope will be many interesting dialogues. Today's event is particularly significant as it is the first time the book will be publicly discussed. My hope is that the panel will provide us with novel insights into Mr. Pillay's life and expand on the historic context he recollects through the shared memories and expertise of our esteemed panelists. As co-author, I was perhaps the first audience for Mr. Pillay's full life story. If my experience listening to and later assisting him in Crafting that story acts as any guide. His memoirs will interest, entertain, and inspire. Mr. Pillay's purpose for writing was not to make any sweeping statements. As he caveats in chapter one, these are my memories, my life as I have lived it, seen through my eyes. If the reader is able to gain something, however minute, from reading my story, that is a plus. Still, I personally found the margin of that plus rather large and drew many lessons, both from the man and his enterprising spirit. Mr. Pillay wore many hats in his time, and so it might even be possible to speak of multiple Gopinath Pillays in this book, the journalist, the teacher, the businessman, the diplomat, and more still. His book has four parts, early life, professional career, public service, as well as a conclusion where he reflects on his place on the arc of a much bigger Singapore story. For purposes of today's conversation, I realize it might be helpful to provide some background into the major milestones the book recounts. Part one opens with the arrival of Mr. Pillay's parents to Singapore and his birth at a time when many from the Indian community were also settling here on the lookout for jobs at the turn of the century. At the age of three, his mother took him and his sister on a family trip to visit their grandparents' home in Kerala before the outbreak of World War II. The war separated him from his father, who was caught in Singapore for nearly seven years after the Japanese invaded. This was a tumultuous time for India also. 
the Indian independence movement was gaining steam, and the communists were garnering support in Kerala, where they formed government in 1957. Mr. Pillay witnessed these epochal changes growing up amid the paddy fields of his grandfather's estate. When he returned to Singapore as a boy after the war, it was to a vibrant, multiracial, multilingual environment buzzing with, the possi with po political possibility as the British began devolving power. Mr. Pillay vividly recalls the energy of Singapore's early elections, thanks to the newspaper founded by his father, the Kerala Bundu, and the event of his mother running for elections as one of Singapore's first female candidates. As a student of the University of Malaya, he engaged with the politics of the day through activities at the University Socialist Club. Mr. Pillay's life is replete with pivots and junctures, and at each turn, we gain deeper insight into his character. The book traces, for example, the evolution of his global outlook and budding love affair with business. After graduation, he got a job as a journalist at Reuters. Afterwards, he taught at Raffles Institution. A man ever on the move, he risked life abroad as a research officer at Bangkok Bank in Thailand, which opened opportunities for him to wet his feet in the commercial sector as an investment officer in Malaysia. The 1969 Malaysia race riots, unpredictably, then informed his decision to move with his family back to Singapore. Part two fittingly picks up the thread with Mr. Mr. Pillay's lessons as a businessman during an unprecedented period of Singapore's economic development. He recounts his trial by fire, for instance, in reviving a struggling garment factory, where his success in creating global export markets catapulted him to leadership positions in other prominent companies. One of these was Intrico, where he lent his international expertise to navigating a tense trade environment during the Cold War. It was also at Intrico that he was exposed to business with Pakistan and India for the first time. In India, he contributed to a joint venture partnership with Tata Consultancy Services in information technology. This created a network that later assisted him and his partners when they entrepreneurially ventured years later into logistics. Mr. Pillay's phenomenal career did not fail to attract the government's attention. Part three features his experience as one of Singapore's first non-resident ambassadors to Iran and Pakistan, as well as his community contributions back home, such as in his capacity as the first chairman of NTUC Fairprice and the Institute of South Asian Studies. These fascinating experiences constituted the first reason I wanted to partner with Mr. Pillay on this book. The second, and equally important, was how his story animated history. Indeed, this book was my primer into understanding modern Singapore, both in its responses to developments in the region, as well as the crucibles the country underwent to transform its economy. The book's title, More Than the Eye Can See, carries various overlapping meanings. If, from one angle, it speaks to the vast space of memory that is traversed in a single lifetime, it also gestures towards the uncontrollable forces of circumstances. In the memoirs, Mr. Pillay's can-do attitude, juxtaposed against his stoic acceptance of hard realities, presented for me a ponderable paradox. Often, I could not help but reflect on how the challenges he and his colleagues confronted in the 20th century echo and diverge from those we face in the 21st. Mr. Pillay's intention was never to sermonize. Most likely, he would prefer his readers to form their own opinions about this book. The observation I submit as co-author, however, is that the stories Mr. Pillay tells not only reflect the man and his journey, but also a worldview that remains relevant for us today. In the anecdotes he chose to prioritize, he often underscores moments of historical interconnection. In business pursuits, he partnered with persons from diverse backgrounds, and he respected the virtues of other ancient cultures and systems, even when doing so was unpopular. His internationalism does not make him naive. He is a pragmatic businessman. The two questions he leaves us with, how to compromise with others with whom it might be difficult to accommodate, and how to remain dynamic in face of change, appear both as challenge and concern for our brave new era. The future, like the distant past, is beyond our field of view. And for this reason, we are grateful to Mr. Pillay 
for casting his gaze over those verities we cannot lose sight of or should strive to reinvent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vada. I would now like to invite the following distinguished panelists on the stage for the book discussion. Mr. George Yeo, former cabinet minister of Singapore and visiting scholar at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, NUS. And Professor Tommy Koh, Emeritus Professor of Law, NUS, and Ambassador at Large at Singapore's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Joining us via Zoom from Delhi is Mr. Tarun Das, former Director General at Confederation of Indian Industry, India. And today's panel discussion will be chaired by Professor Tan Tayong, ISIS Chairman, Professor of Humanities History, Yale and US College, and President Designate for the Singapore University of Social Sciences. Distinguished panelists, please. I shall now hand over the floor to Professor Tan. Professor Tan, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So this afternoon's event is, um, in a way, the second part of the book's launch. Um, as John explained earlier, the book was officially launched last Saturday by uh, Emeritus Senior Minister Ko Chok Tong at a private event. And um, the book was not made public uh, yet. But it will, uh, it's being sold today, so I think most of you will get to see a copy. Uh, but John, um, John Bader, the uh, co-author, has earlier given us a good synopsis of the content of the book. So I just want to quickly recap that the book operates at two levels. At one level, this memoir chronicles the life story of Ambassador Billy, intimately shared by the protagonist and admirably conveyed by, by John. Um, you will find in the book a riveting story of a businessman, writer, banker, well-respected member of the South Asian diaspora, well-decorated community leader, a loving husband, beauty father, and grandfather. Um, yet, as you go through the pages of this fascinating book, you will find that the value of the book goes beyond the autobiographical element. Ambassador Pillay's story is set against the larger story of how modern Singapore came to be what it is today, through insights into important historical episodes, as well as how the country has responded and adapted to changes in the region. As ESM Go said at the launch of the book, and I quote, Gopi is an outstanding member of the pioneer generation who made significant contributions to Singapore. His life story is also rich archival material for the Singapore story. It is a remarkable journey of learning, determination, achievements, and contributions." Unquote. Ambassador Pillay was my boss at ISIS. He was instrumental in appointing me as the first director of ISIS when it was set up in 2004. As recounted in a book, I had promised him that I'll stay at ISIS for six months at the time, but I ended up not <laughs> leaving ISIS and still uh, here, succeeding him as um, chairman of the board. Such is the persuasive power of the man. Um, and Mr. Pillay has led ISS with tremendous passion, foresight, and care. And the Institute is ever grateful to him for developing us into a premier institute for the study of contemporary South Asia. This afternoon's session will look more intimately and closely at Ambassador Pillay's uh, memoirs through three close associates of his, individuals who have known him both at the professional and personal levels for many years now. Panelists will offer important perspectives and insights into the book through their unique interaction with Mr. Pillay personally, as well as through their well-regarded expertise in the academia, diplomacy, and business. Um, I think the panelists are well known, and their bio data is on, the, on your table, so I'm not gonna spend time introducing individually. But suffice it to say, you know, these are three excellent individuals who will have lots to, to say and share 
about Mr. Pillay. So I'll invite each to speak for about uh, five to ten minutes, and then after that, when um, all three presentations are made, uh, we'll have an open discussion. So with that, let me first invite Mr. George Yeo, former Foreign Minister of Singapore. Um, Mr. Yeo, please. <coughs> Yeah, we have a, you are comfortable with, we've got a panel. <coughs> Mrs. Pillay, uh, family of uh, Gopinath, uh, Excellencies, dear friends, I enjoyed traveling with uh, Gopi. Uh, in fact, every encounter with him enriched me except on one occasion. Um, I knew him in different roles. Just a few nights ago, I was with uh, Janelle Putucheri, and I was talking about Gopi, and I said, he's a proud Malayali. Then Janelle's response was, is there any other sort? <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot about what, who the Malayalis are, and Kerala, I've been there twice, but uh, only know the state superficially. But he deepened my understanding and helped explain to me why they are such a successful community in Singapore. I also knew him as a businessman. He would tell me stories about India, and he showed me the snowman operations. I visited one of his uh, warehouses Coal stores. At one point when I was in Kerry Logistics, I considered whether Kerry Logistics should acquire his company. But it, it was much too expensive for us, much too successful an operation for us to, to absorb. When he was our non resident ambassador to Iran, he was a very keen advocate of closer relations between Singapore and Iran. At that time, uh, he wanted the front, I was trade minister, he wanted the foreign ministry to send a delegation there. But Prof. Jayakuma uh, told him, you, you ask George, he's in trade industry, he, was, he would be better able to travel to Iran, less sensitive than for a foreign minister. So he came to see me a number of times and I was finally persuaded to lead the delegation there. And it was not long after Singapore had uh, tried to separate the Iranian Siamese twins. Uh, it was not successful, but it was uh, at the wish of the twins themselves, who knew the risk, who accepted the risk, and wanted the attempt to be made. The whole of Iran followed the surgery, and everyone mourned together. So when I went there, uh, brought uh, Lu Zhong Yong from Raffles Hospital, uh, where the operation was conducted. I also brought along Philip Yeo and, and other friends. Gopi came to see me, he said, the Iranians have a great sense of their own civilization. It would be a good idea if they know that you appreciate the history. Why don't you visit Shiraz first? I thought it was a brilliant idea. After Doha, I, we flew to Shiraz, visited Persepolis, went to Hafez's tomb. I was just following what Gopi suggested I do because I knew that he did not make recommendations lightly. And I was absolutely right to follow him. By the time I arrived in Tehran, they, they felt that, yes, I'm aware of the, the history. And it made my visit much easier, even though bilaterally we had a lot of problems with them. A few years later, I went there a second time as foreign minister. I can't quite remember, but I think Gopi accompanied me that second time too. But it was a little more formal when I went there as foreign minister. I enjoyed Gopi as a, as a travel companion and found reasons to include him in my delegation. We were in the Middle East once, I think it was in Saudi Arabia. I'm not sure if he accompanied me to Libya. Um, He would give me advice. He would give me his observations. And I found his insights invaluable. P. 
P.G. Dambram, Finance Minister, Home Minister of India, Chetia, had long wanted me to visit Chetinan. And I, it's a little out of the way. So one day when my wife and I called on him in Delhi, he told my wife, George doesn't want to go to Chetinan. You come, I'll show you Chetinan. <laughs> so I was so embarrassed, I quickly arranged my visit to Chetinan. I said, Gopi, you, you, you follow me because I, I don't know enough about India and I thought someone like him who understands Singapore and who has a deep sense of India would be a very good in-house counsel to me. But it was hot. It was in May. The temperature was 40 degrees. When we were at Tanjabor, we had visited one of the old libraries. It was dusty and my wife did not feel very well. And she said, I won't follow you to the great Chola temple, the Sri Briha Ishwaran temple. And Gopi, who also felt his ears, said, yeah, I, I keep your wife company. So I walked into the temple, which was famous because uh, the great Chola king uh, had destroyed Sri Vijaya. In one monsoon, in order to capture the Song Dynasty trade, the Chola fleet sailed through the Sunda Straits with the monsoon behind them, destroyed one three Vijayan city after another on both sides of the Malacca Straits. Reinforcements could not come because the winds were against them. And that victory was captured in bar relief, so I was happy to go and see it. It's also a temple where there's a big boulder on top, which shadow never f falls on the ground. So then I went to Chetinat, Sri Minakshi and, and all that. Wonderful visit, came back. A year later, I lost elections. Tamil Morasu ran a piece saying, you know, Minister Joshua broke a terrible taboo. He went into that temple by the front gate. You should never do that. <laughs> so I asked Gopi, I said, what happened? Why didn't you advise me? I don't think he knew. But anyway, it gave me a chance always to rip him and to put him on the defensive because I always felt on the defensive when I was with him. So when these memoirs were written, I was invited by Tai Yong to, to uh, say a few words. I, I, I accepted immediately and I do it with pleasure and with the most wonderful memory this afternoon. Thank you. You. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Yu. Now, next I invite uh, Professor Tommy Koh, um, who has known Gopi since, uh, uh, Master Pile, since they were in university together. So, um, Professor Koh, please. Um, thank you, Taeyong. Um, I want to publicly confess that Professor Tan Taeyong is my second most favorite historian in Singapore. <laughs> the, the most favorite is Professor Huang Kang-Hu. So, Taeyong, it's a great pleasure to be here with you and to be moderated by you. Mr. John Vetter, who done a splendid job helping Gopi to write his memoirs. My uh, favorite boss, Mr. George Yeo, and my guru in India, Tarunji. I want to begin by <clears throat> saluting Gopi's one and only love, Shamala. Shamala, can you please stand? <clears throat> in, in, the, in the book, Gopi acknowledged that sh she was his only love, his uh, advisor, mentor, health giver, and inspiration. Without you, Shamala, Gopi would not have been able to accomplish so many things in his life. So thank you. <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge the presence of their three children, Prita, Prakash, and Priya. I would like on this occasion to also recognize three persons who 
work very closely with Gopi in the public sector and business sector. And these are Chandra Das, Sapao Kata, and Haida Sitwala. So let's give these three guys a round of applause. I also want to recognize one of Gopi's oldest friends and a dear comrade from our Socialist Cup Day, Tan Guan Heng. <clears throat> Guan Heng, can you just raise your hand? Okay, now, now my, my brief remarks. Uh, I'm afraid to exceed five minutes of time. <laughs> I've known Gopi for a total of 64 years. We both joined the University of Malaya um, in the same year, 1957, but he was sent away for his freshman year to Kuala Lumpur. So when he returned to Singapore in 1958, we met at the Bukit Timah campus. We are very good friends, and I often call him my Indian brother. And because of our Socialist Cup affiliation, <clears throat> I've also sometimes called him Comrade Gopi. And I, when I feel cheeky, I will call him my socialist billionaire. Uh, he, he accepted that by, by saying that only in rupees. <laughs> uh, we were students at the Bukit Timah campus until 1961. We both joined the University Socialist Club and were very active members. We were united in our political vision to help build a democratic and socialist country and society. We were students at a time when colonialism and imperialism were coming to an end. We wanted our country to be free of British colonial rule, and we debated the question whether Singapore's future laid in joining the peninsula or to be on its own. We also debated the comparative merit of capitalism, socialism, and communism. We had dreams beyond Singapore of helping to build a more equal and more prosperous world. Gopi and I gradually became leaders of the club. <clears throat> the other members, uh, the other leaders of the club, including Guan Heng, uh, T. P. B. Menon, and Chu Ti Singh. We were both active in writing, editing, and distributing the club's publication, Fajr. The job was very challenging, but we did it with passion and commitment. In my final year as a law student, uh, one of my teachers, Panch Kumaraswamy, uh, pulled me aside and said, Tommy, it's time for you to focus on your studies and reduce your ECAs. So I told Gopi that I couldn't be the president of the Socialist Club. Can you please take my place? Like the good guy that he was, he accepted. Um, I want to add that during the time when we were in the leadership of the club, we kept the club and Fajar safe by being neutral between the PAP and Barisan. We had friends on both sides and actually tried to prevent the split from happening. We also knew that if the club were to become pro-Barisan, the PAP would destroy us, which, they did, which it did subsequently. After graduating from the university in 1961, our paths diverged, and we reconnected in 1990 when I returned from my posting to Washington, D.C. The bond of friendship and mutual trust was so deep that it took us no time to rekindle our friendship. We were also brought together by two other things, um, diplomacy and think tanks. Apart from being a very successful businessman, Gopi was also a very good diplomat. As George Ho said, he served with distinction for 18 years as our non-resident ambassador to Iran. He was concurrently our non-resident 
ambassador to Pakistan. And because of a deep knowledge of India, the ministry subsequently appointed him as one of our ambassadors at large. Gopi had a strategic mind. At a time when Narendra Modi was chief minister, he was being boycotted by the West because the world held him accountable for the riots in Gujarat, which resulted in the death of many Muslims. But Gopi advised PM Gotraktong to visit Ahmadabad and see Chief Minister Modi. Prime Minister Modi had never forgotten that. And to this day, when he sees Gotraktong, he calls him his guru. Now, this, this side trip to, Guja, to Gujarat was suggested by Gopi. Gopi, as uh, Tayong said, was the founding chairman of the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies. Through his efforts and the efforts of the team, I dare say that ISAS today is a world-class think tank. As co-chair of the India-Singapore Strategic Dialogue and the China-Singapore Forum, I always ask Gopi to join the Singapore delegation. I wanted the benefit from his advice and his wisdom. Uh, I'll, t I'll conclude with a, a funny uh, memory. In 2019, the annual China-Singapore Forum was being held in Chongqing. Unfortunately, I caught a bug on a plane. And by the time I arrived in Chongqing, I lost my voice. So I asked Gopi to be the deputy leader of the delegation and to speak on my behalf. I also wanted to send a subtle message to my Chinese friends in Chongqing. And the message is, Singapore is not a Chinese nation, but a multiracial one. I will conclude. I regard my Indian brother Gopi as the national treasure of Singapore. He calls himself a jack of all trades, but he's a masterful jack of all trades. He's made invaluable contribution to Singapore in business, in culture, in diplomacy, and in nation building. He's also a builder of successful institutions, which include NTUC FairPrice. I think people will not know this, but he was the founding chairman of NTUC FairPrice, ISAS, and also the Indian Heritage Center. So in conclusion, I would say, to Shamala to convey this message to Gopi. My message to Gopi, dear Gopi, I'm proud to be your friend and your old comrade. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Okay, um, well, last but not least, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Tarun Das uh, a dear friend of Ambassador Pillay and uh, a collaborator with ISAS for many years. Um, Mr. Das will be joining us from India via Zoom. So have we got him on screen? Ah, Tarun, can you hear me? Uh, you are mute, I think. Tarun, we've lost, we've lost your image as well. Ah, okay. No voice. Yeah, we can't hear you. Just a minute. Can you say something? We'll see if we can pick it up. Uh, Dayong, it's a great honor to be here. Ah. Yes. Good. Yes, Please good carry morning. on, uh, Tarun. Okay. Over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Tayong, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here uh, with all of you, and especially to follow uh, George and Tommy, uh, very good friends of mine. I want to thank ISAS and you as its chairman 
for uh, inviting me and especially to Mrs. Pillay and the family. Um, thank you very much, Mrs. Pillay, for including me in this program. For those of you who have uh, yet to read the book, so there was an announcement earlier that the book is yet to be out. Uh, John gave you a very good sense of what the book contains. But it's about my very special friend, Gopi, uh, who I have known uh, not as long as Tommy, but 29 years. It's not bad. My association with Singapore started in September 1993, and Gopi and I hit it off from that time. And we were introduced, as it happens, by someone who has been mentioned more than once today, uh, Mr. Go Chok Tong, uh, the then Prime Minister, and now ESM. And that friendship spanned uh, three decades and spanned many activities. We were uh, together in the India-Singapore Strategic Dialogue, uh, which Tommy led uh, from the Singapore side. But it was Gopi always sitting on the right of Tommy. And I would say, Tommy, that almost as if the two of you were co-chairing it together, because the understanding between the two was so great. Um, more recently, ESM involved Gopi in the Singapore-India Partnership Foundation, which we had set up earlier, and uh, which Satpal was uh, co-chairing from the Singapore side. And we also got involved by Gopi because he always pulled you in to whatever he was doing. He pulled us into the India Heritage Center and into discussions about India-Singapore cooperation in culture, in the arts, and uh, music, and all of that. And of course, we all had to uh, visit the India Heritage Center and uh, do the tour, do the tour with him. Uh, of course, always escorted by him. His life is extraordinary. He makes it a point to give a feeling in the book that he has an ordinary background, but it only reinforces what I have always felt, that ordinary people like us, given the opportunity, and given the trust, can achieve extraordinary things. And Gopi in his lifetime has achieved extraordinary things. And I have been witness to that in many aspects of what Gopi has done. It's interesting to see when you all of you read the book, there are about a hundred pages or more, if I'm not wrong, John, uh, mm. is devoted to his life in the private sector, starting from Bangkok into Malaysia, uh, back to Singapore, working with Taiwan, uh, working with India. Uh, it's quite a big chunk of his life was in the private sector, first as an employee, and then as a very successful entrepreneur. As George has said, his company was too expensive to buy because it was so successful. And that is to the credit of Gopi and the team that he built. But what uh, really comes through to me, is, you know, when Gopi came to India, we used to meet very often, and we used to do joint events between ISAS and in the Ananta Aspen Center, especially for uh, visiting uh, Singaporean ministers, Mrs. Pillay would always be there. And uh, she was quiet, but she was at the table, but she was always there. And this sense of her centrality and the family's centrality comes out so strongly in the book. Uh, there's a chapter there, it's called A Young Lady. And the chapter is from page 70 to page 76. <laughs> and that young lady is Mrs. Pillay, who Tommy rightly asked her to stand and to be 
greeted and applauded by all of us. Um, that story of his courtship of uh, the, the current and one and only Mrs. Pillay is an amazing story. And how he goes to uh, her uh, resi student's residence and how he sits there and waits to see her constantly and how he is ticked off, I think, by the security guard, you know, because he was coming all the time. And uh, but, but his perseverance in all aspects of his life, but especially uh, when it came to reaching out to Mrs. Pillay was, was amazing. And uh, the centrality of his life, his, his references to his children, grandchildren, uh, to Prakash, to Prita, to Priya, are, are very, very kind of, they come through the book at, at different times. And you feel the, the importance of family values uh, that Gopi had. I want to say a few words about his involvement with India. Um, he was a straight shooter. India is not the simplest place to do business in. Uh, it is a complex place. We have a legacy of uh, many, many years of micromanagement of the economy uh, by uh, previous governments, which uh, a lot of it has been dismantled but we still have a way to go. Gopi managed the strategies to get into India, to do business in India, to be successful in India, better than any other businessman that I know. Especially, certainly, better than any Singaporean businessman that I know. And he was recognized or not only for the business that he did in India and with India, but for all the leadership he provided to ISAS with India and, and many other activities that Indian government recognized him with a national award. And he's one of few, like Tommy and Satpal and George, of course, who were similarly recognized by the government of India. And this is very unusual for a businessman to be <clears throat> recognized, but Gopi is a very unusual person. Uh, he had a sense of humor, and his sense of humor, he would say to me that, uh, and, and he would say it in a with a smile on his face that, you know, I'm losing all my hair, and I'm going gray doing business in India, because it's so complicated. And he would share his different travails with me, um, and a little bit of that, not not in great detail, is is, is covered in the book. Um, More than the eye can see is uh, an amazing book. It is an amazing book about a wonderful man, uh, a wonderful friend, and uh, I, I used to call him always the smiling shooter because he would smile as he was, you know. Punching you in, in the midriff, as it were. And there are two wonderful lines in the book I, I, which stay with me. And uh, Mrs. Pillay won't mind if I, I, I quote those lines. Um, one is, he says, he's speaking about his uh, father in law. And he says, at, at one stage, he, he is transformed from an outlaw into an in law. So you have to read the book to understand the meaning. His father-in-law was not exactly enamored with him to begin with, but uh, uh, Gopi became, moved from a, becoming an outlaw into an out in-law. And there is another line in the book uh, where, uh, you know, Gopi was interested in uh, politics. He had uh, socialistic tendencies, uh, as indeed everybody from Kerala by and large has. And uh, in one of his conversations with the astrologer, uh, before he, I think before Mrs. Pillay will know this better than I do, but probably before he went to Bangkok to, to work in, a, uh, in the Bangkok bank, 
he asked in his, the astrologer uh, what will happen to him if he stays with politics and socialism and the <coughs> astrologer said you will go to jail so i will stop there now great man great friend and john congratulations for putting this book together with gopi and thank you all for asking me to be here thank you thank you very much tarun please stay on the screen uh, because i am now going to open the discussion to the floor there may be questions um, that may be directed to you but i now like to open it and invite um, members of the audience to either ask questions of the panelists or share your reflections or share your thoughts your interactions with ambassador pile so um, we'll take about half an hour for this session so any takers anybody would like to um, have the mic yes please uh, i see some, uh, are we passing the mic around yes no the mic thank you run okay <coughs> right the reason why i asked you run and come is because govi and me were in the same school around the same time now professor tomiko just now explained that he knows govi for 64 years right is it true and i know him for 65 <coughs> years so one year more than you <laughs> Now Gobi when you when we were in the St Andrews school at the A level Gobi was not only a good student but he was very active in extracurricular activities you may not know that extracurricular activity does not mean just sports alone of course he, if we were all good sportsmen we used to play rugby whatever you can think of in St Andrews school but he was also in drama and acting i don't think you knew that he was a good actor actually that time but later in life he was a real political or or diplomatic actor that's a different thing because i'm sure uh, dr mr professor cordomico will say that all diplomats have to be actors i'm not sure whether it's true or not because you have to go very diplomatically now by the way i did not go into politics or economics or teaching but as i've spent for teaching for a short while i became a cardiologist which is entirely different from what he was and we used to meet in many occasions sometimes uh, for dinner for example because my wife and uh, sadi and shamla are good friends and they had meetings from time to time for lunch and other meetings so i am very delighted to say that gobi is not only an excellent person he is a good friend of many people and he will remain as a good friend and i wish him all the health and happiness in life and i'm very delighted to see that the book is now available in fact i have written a book about 2 years ago which was uh, launched by uh, minister tan siling at the, one of the <coughs> restaurant one of the places at that time only 50 people were allowed to come because of the covid restrictions but gobi wrote a very nice chapter forward for my book and uh, whenever anybody ap approach gobi for any help be it indians malays chinese or anybody from singapore he was always ready to help them politically not politically i don't mean politically but financially and otherwise because he's a good philanthropist also with that i wish all the best for the book and i f i feel that every one of you must buy the book and read it thank you very much thank you very much sir <laughs> sir for the benefit of the audience can you introduce yourself uh I am I, I didn't get your name earlier sorry I am Dr VP Nair from ah, okay. cardiologist interventional cardiologist from Mount Elizabeth Hospital thank you very much I was a teacher at one stage for a short while okay <laughs> lovely uh any 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 other um speakers ah uh, yes please hi um, very interesting uh, my name is Mano Subnani um I've been a journalist and sort of investment banker. I've known Gopi as a, in my journalist career as well as as a friend. Um, I mean, I I haven't read the book obviously yet, um, but listening to the panelists, the distinguished panelists, and also the co-author, um, I was wondering one aspect hasn't come out yet. Maybe as uh, 
as the panelists who, who knew who know him very well and, and um, may have had the privilege of uh, reading the book first. What, what, are the, what are the values that come across, you know? Uh, what values did he hold dear? I think as, in, as a person, uh, values can be personal values, whether it's honesty, whatever. It can also be values you hold in terms of, uh, as Prof Ko said, you know, there is more socialist values. So I'd like to hear more about his values that, that made his life uh, worthwhile, you know, because we are here today, and uh, to, to understand him better. And also, I think um, maybe we shouldn't uh, only focus on the positive. I mean, if in your experience, there was something uh, you thought could have been done, could have been better, Gopi would have made him a greater man. I mean, he's a great man, but greater man in that sense. <laughs> maybe you would like to also mention that, because I think we are humans. We can't be perfect. So what is it that he, he lacked, you know? I'd like to also hear that. Oh, thank okay. you. Uh, I, I thank, uh, thank, thank our good friend Manu for his question. Um, I don't know his imperfect part. So maybe somebody could answer that. But I will try to answer your question. What are his core values? First, he was a very hardworking individual, high work ethic. Second, he is honest and honourable. Third, he has respect for everybody. And fourth, he, he cares for people, not just those above him, but people who are co-equal, and very importantly, people who are beneath him. That is an egalitarian quality, maybe he came from his Kerala background and socialist club heritage. So these are the positive values that I associate Gopi with. And uh, maybe somebody else can tell us what are the foibles which prevented him from becoming an even greater man. Um, George, do you have anything to add? Uh, or Tarun, or John, in the process of Tarun. reflecting, uh, an anything you want to add about his values that you've picked up? OK, never mind. I'm going to. Uh, I know. Oh, it's Zainal. Zainal. Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Zainal here. Um, I must confess that I have not read the book, neither do I know Gopi as well as distinguished panelists. But the limited uh, time I spend with Gopi, I really treasure and value. I have two questions comments, questions, uh, if I may get a response from both panelists and also, if possible, from John, too. One is that John made reference to the challenges of compromise. I wonder whether, in fact, they, whether you can cite some examples. What were they and how actually he responded to that challenge? I mean, right, right, right now we know we are faced with this challenge about uh, compromising or adjusting to the realities about the relationship between LGBT and the religious groups. Uh, I think Singapore is grappling with that, the way government looks at it, the way religious gr groups look at it, and also Singaporeans in general. So what are the other examples of this challenge of compromises which we have to live with. The second point which I like to hear is also about, you know, Gopi shares a lot of the values which I think of the emerging Singapore, independent Singapore with, with its challenges too. But uh, trying to relate those challenges to the young is not easy. I mean, often when I try to cite my own example of I was almost killed in racial riots and the importance of understanding multiculturalism, the young would remind me, hey, please, lah, enough of your grandpa's stories. <laughs> you know, we are not Chinese, we are not, Sing we're not Malays, we're not Indians, yeah. but we are Singaporeans and we look at things differently. So how would the young, yourself included, uh, John, relate to the kind of uh, sharing which Gopi has done through the book and uh, how do we ensure that in fact some of the lessons which he actually is trying to share with us is actually valued and uh, applied to by the young. Thank you. Go 
Snoopy is a great storyteller. And some of my most enjoyable moments with him are uh, talking about his uh, Malayali background. Uh, Proud Malayali, lots of stories. Uh, even once when we were talking about the Jaffna Tamils and how they are such high achievers, he attribu attributed that partly to the Malayalis. And I kind of laughed it off until I did some research and said, oh, actually, there's some truth in what he said. He had a great sense of India and had insights into India which greatly benefited me. When I dealt with him on Iran, he gave me a sense that he had gotten underneath their skin and knew how they thought and they felt. So Zaino, when we talk about young Singaporeans, I hope they will not become vanilla flavor. Because if they are, then Singapore from being a shiny crystal with multiple facets will become a dull pebble. So I'd much rather if Singaporeans have a great sense of the richness which makes us what we are and the richness which produces a great man like Gopi. Tommy, you want to add? Maybe I would say a word about compromise, uh, one of Zaino's questions. Uh, I want to say that compromise is a good word, it's not a bad word. And I was very disturbed a few years ago when I asked a Myanmar friend whether the word compromise exists in the Vermis vocabulary, and he said it did not. Um, it is necessary for us to compromise, whether in our work as a diplomat or in our work as a businessman. I think Satpal, Chandra Das, and Haida will agree that when you're negotiating uh, with another country or another company or another regulator, you, I mean, you have to give and take and compromise. The important thing, of course, is to protect your minimum interest, whether it be national interest or corporate interest. So Gopi and I are both practitioners, practitioners of the art of compromise. And I want, to, you, I want to convince you today that <coughs> compromise is a good word, not a bad word. Tarun, you mentioned uh, the difficulties of doing business in India and how uh, Ambassador Pillay was a pioneer and I'm sure he broke through many barriers. So in the story of compromises, uh, do you have anything to share in that regard? Well, I will give you one example, Tayong. Uh, which is a real example from Gopi's life. Uh, when he was working in the private sector, he was asked by his uh, boss to become the, I think, the general manager of the company. And uh, Gopi felt that uh, his becoming the general manager would not be the right thing. And he developed a compromise. And the compromise was oh, that somebody else should be with him and they would run the company together. That was the compromise that there would be. Yeah. And the two of them ran the company together and ran it successfully and became very good friends with a give and take. And um, so this is just an example. And in his work with India, he, you know, Dayong, he always looked for solutions. He was in the solution business, as he said. It was, when he faced with a problem, faced with a challenge, he would try to find a way to resolve that problem. He wouldn't run away from it. He would not try to decry it because he realized that Singapore and India had different systems, different cultures. And but he worked across cultures, and that was a great thing that he did. I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, while waiting for the next um, question, I, I noticed uh, Mr. Rajaram, who is the uh, chairman of the Indian Heritage Center, and that's another of Ambassador Pillay's yeah. long-lasting contributions to Singapore, the establishment of the Indian Heritage Center. I was with him um, for most part of the journey when he had to spend uh, hours and days and weeks uh, meeting a whole range of people, collect views, struck compromises, and try to bring this mind-boggling diversity of the South Asian community 
um, to build the Indian Heritage Centre, which to all intents and purposes have succeeded. So I was wondering whether Bhavani or Raj, would you like uh, to share some thoughts about Ambassador Pillay's contributions? Because he also chaired the Indian Heritage Centre board for a, a decade, I would think. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, Raj, but you know professors are like that. They like to point to students and say, hey, can you answer a question? So. Good. Hi, good afternoon. Tayang, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> <laughs> my association with uh, Ambassador Gopi actually goes back before uh, the Indian Heritage Center. Uh, he was also a, uh, one of the trustees when I was with Cinder. Uh, and I've had um, a few encounters with him, but of course I knew him and uh, got to know him a little better during my time at uh, the Indian Heritage Center when I was serving the board. The Indian Heritage Center is a, not exactly uh, the easiest place to run because of the diversity of hmm. the place uh, and the competing demands by the various uh, sub-ethnic commu communities. And um, what I picked up, which I think, which I hope will hold me in good stead as I chair the uh, Indian Heritage Center now, uh, is this masterly compromise uh, and the manner in which he was able to bring together the various communities uh, com and command a, a level of respect. Uh, uh, we all miss him, uh, to put it mildly, uh, and, uh, and are totally aware that we have uh, very, very big shoes to fill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raj. Satpal, please. Uh, in the front here. Uh, uh, there's a mic coming to you. He was my student in school. <laughs> Gopi has been an excellent friend of over 50 years. <coughs> he started off by being a client of mine in my previous role as a tired and retired lawyer. <coughs> We've had differences, but the differences between us, whether in business or in other areas, have never detracted from our friendship. And if anybody, anybody thinks that Gopi's life has been a bed of roses, they are wrong. He has gone through plenty of ups and downs. I have personally been aware of them, but he's always never lost his composure or his <coughs> single-mindedness to be honest with himself and the job that he has been entrusted. A lot of these jobs had nothing to do with the earning of money, or a position of power, or a position of strength. It was public service right through. Gopi is a friend that I still wanting him to be as well as he always was, so that we can go back to that old relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarkha. Any, any other? Yes, uh, Girija, please. I haven't known Gopi for that long, but I served on the ISAS board for about 10 years with Gopi because he pushed me, and it's very difficult to say no to Gopi. <clears throat> One of the things that I always remember him one of the key things which ISAS was doing initially as we started was the South Asian Diaspora Convention. I mean, Satpal and Chandra would remember that. And <clears throat> Tarun will remember because I was also uh, mentoring the CII on the other side. And I remember he was arguing about whether we should have this or not. And I said, South Asian Diaspora doesn't exist. South Asia doesn't talk to each other. That is the reality of history of South Asia. And Gopi insisted, 
He says, but this is what Gerja we need to do. And we had three sessions over every two years. I think it's one of the most successful programs of ISAS. And I, Taeyong, you were involved very heavily in that. Mm -hmm. And I think it just showed a very different way of looking at a historical problem. We've always known about the Indian diaspora, which is large. But to bring a South Asian diaspora of everyone together in Singapore was absolutely unusual. It's very typical to Gopi. Thank you. Thank you, Kiruja. Now, I, 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 uh, Hanik, just a minute, huh? because we have a Zoom audience as well. So several oh, people okay. have dialed in to watch uh, these proceedings. Yeah. And I am told that there are some okay, questions from Zoom. Oh, okay. So Jordan, can um, Hanik, I'll come back to you. Um, Jordan, can we maybe take two or three questions? If we cannot see them on screen, can it's OK. Just read uh, out the questions. Yeah, right? Or you can read out the questions if they are sent to you. Sorry? Oh, Vinod Rai. Vinod Rai is a senior visiting fellow at ISES, former Auditor General of India. Uh, Vinod, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Vinod, go ahead with the question. Okay. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity, Sayong. It's absolutely a delight and a privilege for me to be participating in today's uh, discussions. Uh, Unlike all of you, I did not know Mr. Uh, Pillay for 60 or 65 years. I've known him for just six odd years. But believe me, those six years have made, given a made an indelible impression about the gentleman on me. His qualities of head and heart, his qualities of being a human being. And that's why I was uh, wanting to uh, give my views or share some of the things with you people. Uh, because somebody asked a question about what about his qualities. I think the gentleman's best qualities is that he has the absolutely impeccable qualities of being a good human being. In my short association with him, I've seen him as a friend. I've seen him as a family member. I've seen him with his qualities as a diplomat and the platform of ISAS that he built up. Uh, Tayong, you would remember, in fact, you recruited me and I was invited by Mr. Gopinath Pillay to join ISAS. And that has been, in fact, of my retired life, a very high point. Uh, the more I associated with him, the more uh, respect I gained for him. And one of the common bonds that he and I share is that he's a Malayali, who belongs to Trishur, a district in Kerala. I am a non-Malayali, but I consider myself to be domiciled in Kerala because I am from the Kerala cadre of the Indian Administrative Service. And I served for seven years in that district. We know a lot of common people in that place. We've often gotten together and discussed various things. And these stories of uh, uh, his father being in Malaysia. He has remarkable uh, uh, stories to narrate. I saw the book, Harnik lent it to me for a short while. I just scanned through it. I've not been able to go through it. But I think the platform of ISAS that he has built up, the pedestal that he created, uh, the visibility that he has given to ISAS, and the ment mentoring that he gave to all of us is absolutely remarkable. He used to hold weekly meetings. It was a pleasure for us to attend th those meetings. And <clears throat> we always felt that in those meetings, he was better informed about current affairs around Singapore or South Asia than any one of us who considered ourselves to be experts. So I still hope that he will pull out of uh, being un unwell just now. And we will be able to interact with Mr. Mr. Gopinath Pillay. But I, I am quite positive that the book is going to be a landmark and it will be an inspirational story for lots of youngsters and others uh, who will be able to read it. Thank you very much, uh, Tayong, for giving me this opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Vino. Nice to hear from you. Do we have another question from Zoom? OK, if not, uh, Hanik. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
I just actually, uh, you know, every book has a story and every book has a message or more. Uh, I mean, the three panelists have read the book. Uh, if there were two or three or even more messages that Ambassador Pele wanted to convey through his book, what would those be? I mean, his, his career span was quite extensive. So whether it's business, whether dealing with India, uh, working with the government, what are some of the messages that he wanted to actually convey to the readers? Thank you. Um, Albert? Uh, so wait, um, we'll, we'll take the two questions together because we're running a bit. Albert, please, your, your comments first, and then I'll invite the panelists oh, to. Uh, thanks, Tayong. I don't normally speak at these occasions, uh, but uh, I, I thought maybe I don't have a question that maybe contribute some anecdotes about uh, Gopi because I'm, I'm very fond of uh, Gopi, whom I've always known as a remarkable, uh, warm and compassionate man. And I've not known him for several decades. I've only known him for about 20 years. And a lot of it uh, was to do with actually uh, ESM because I used to be principal private secretary to Mr. Go. So I think I first knew Gopi in 2004 uh, for two reasons. One, we were working on the ISAS at that point because Mr. Goh was one of the champions and his principal prize secretary. I think I might have wrote the, the paper on the formation of ISAS. Um, and of course, once ISAS was launched, uh, I was on the board and at various points in my life, I tried to step down from it. Uh, but Gopioys, like you said, a few months, it became a few years, <laughs> and then it became 20 years. And I think I finally stepped down on the board when uh, chairman changed, yeah. And with Gopi, it's always easy to give in, because if you don't give in, he'll nag you to death <laughs> when he wants you to do something. Um, so that's one memory. Uh, the other memory is, of course, uh, what Tommy referred to about the visit to Gujarat, because I was also the principal private secretary to Mr. Goh when he went to Gujarat and met uh, Mr. Modi for the first time. Uh, I thought it was a very astute piece of advice which Gopi gave at that point. Uh, what not universally supported within foreign ministry, by the way, at that point, but I thought Gopi gave very profound and very good advice. And it is really uh, the genesis of a very long friendship between Mr. Goh and Mr. Modi. Uh, the third one relates to, third anecdote relates to uh, Gopi's uh, stint as non resident ambassador uh, to Iran. Uh, Mr. Goh visited Iran in 2004, actually the first visit by a Singapore Prime Minister to Iran ever in 2004. Gopi was the NRA. I remember he brought us to a lovely restaurant called, I think, Shashlik, which I think has probably some of the best lamb chops in the world. And we talked excitedly about uh, being in Iran for the first time and getting ready to meet uh, President Hatami at that point. And Gopi said, uh, appealed to Mr. Goh to say, I've been NRA to Iran now for, I think at that point, 14 years, please let me go. And we all said, Gopi, if you manage to get Mr. Goh to go to Iran again the second time, then you can retire. We thought it was a joke, but in 2007, the miracle happened. <laughs> Uh, he managed to persuade Mr. Goh to go back again at that point. The president was uh, President Ahmadinejad. Uh, I think we had, uh, we had a message for Mr. Ahmadinejad which was uh, carried uh, between Mr. Goh and uh, the president. But again, we went back to Shashlik to eat the lamb chops again. And I think at that point after the visit, one or two years later, I think after 18 years in as NRA, uh, finally Gopi was allowed to step down. But I think uh, like many others around the room, we have very warm, uh, very friendly memories of what a wonderful and remarkable man, a very compassionate man. Uh, and we, we, you know, we look forward to his uh, good health, and we also look forward to reading his book. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Okay, uh, now I'm, I'm going to pause here now and, and ask uh, the panelists if they would like to address uh, her next question about the main takeaway from the book. I mean, what, what is it that they learned from reading um, Pastor Pillay's story? Um, any, any Maybe takers? the mystery speaker can answer that. Ah, we'll come to that mystery speaker. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I thought my, my main takeaway was how um, he advocated that we should always be resiliently able to adapt to change. And you know, in, in, in his life story, he's adapted to many changes, uh, many inflections, and how you um, deal with those changes, make compromises we have to, but stay central, stay focused on your core values. I thought that was my takeaway reading his story. Um, I think uh, Tommy's got a good point. Uh, we, we've come to the end of this session, but you know, very central to Ambassador Pillay's uh, life story is the family. Uh, and I think it's only fitting that we close this session by hearing from a member of the family, and I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Prakash Pillay, his son, 
um, to share a few words. Uh, Prakash, please. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not taking any more questions. I think we have to end it here. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Tai Yong. Um, they were sort of uh, murmuring between themselves that I was the mystery speaker. It was such a mystery. I didn't know about it until just now. <laughs> uh, so there are no notes or anything, just a, you know, a simple uh, vote of thanks. Uh, there was an invitation earlier to talk about how my father could become better and so on, but I'm going to tiptoe around those kinds of things and just stick <clears throat> to two, uh, two uh, quick points, actually. Uh, the first is, you know, I'm very happy and proud, you know, that my father has done this. Uh, you know, he has led a very, very colorful life. He's done so many things. You know, he calls himself uh, Jack of all trades. He's actually uh, the master of all, you know, as it turned out. In his life, you know, he's managed to straddle public life with private life, private sector with public sector. There are not so many people in this world who can do that so effectively. But one thing that, uh, you know, I agree with uh, Uncle Satpal, you know, his point was that at the end of the day, the thing which mattered to him most was public service. It wasn't about making money, it wasn't about the fame or anything, it was about serving the country. And that is the thing that I think captured uh, his heart. So, you know, I, I'm looking forward to reading this book. Uh, just to share a secret, I haven't read the book. I mean, you know, I, in fact, I just bought it today. Uh, my mother said no free books, and, you know, her rules, and I, I paid my $50, so, so should you. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so the, the, what I'm hoping to see in this book, I, I think there are two facets. One is more about his, his life. I mean, I was there, I could, you could say I had a ringside seat. You know, I, but I've been around only 53 years, he's 85 years old. There's a whole chunk of it. You know, I've heard bits and pieces, I've heard from my grandparents about his life and so on. But I'd be very, very interested to read, uh, you know, uh, more about it and learn more about it. Uh, and I think the second facet of, of, this, of, a, of that point is the, you know, is the, the thing about his, uh, I think Tayong made the point about how his life, there, had a, there was a backdrop to his life which is the geopolitical and the political evolution of Singapore. He, uh, he lived through very, very interesting times. I mean, he was born uh, before the war and found himself in India during the war. Uh, there are lots of wartime stories that came from my grandparents, which you know, the book uh, would possibly have uh, references to. Uh, and then he grew up in the turbulent times of the 50s and 60s, Singapore's independence, the thing with Malaysia and so on. I mean, my father was, it was uh, met my mother in Singapore, but they were uh, living in Malaysia, and where I possibly made a contribution to his decision to come back to Singapore was that during the, the May 69 riots, I was born in July. My mother was heavily pregnant with me, and the experiences he had with curfew, uh, you know, uh, th this was you know, what he told me, uh, led to him thinking that Singapore was the better place. So he left Malaysia and came back to Singapore. And you know, and uh, lived his life from there onwards. You know, so both my elder sister and I were born in, in Malaysia, and we were. I just found out recently that I actually had a Malaysian passport before a Singapore <laughs> passport. I didn't even know that. Maybe it's in the book. Uh, uh, the, the second thing I want to do is maybe to convey uh, thanks to everybody. I think he would be. He would have been really, really happy to be here. He's not in very good health, uh, but to see so many of his very good friends. You know, uh, people who, uh, you know, who have known him for decades, some even longer than I have, very close friends, you know, talking about him, you know, and all the sort of love and affection, the bond that, uh, that he has with so many people in this room. You know, I think he, this is something quite special. So, and I think he would have been very, very, very happy to be here just to sort of, you know, experience that for himself. But uh, we'll try our best to convey all of that to him, and you know, and you know, I'm sure he'll feel uh, the love uh, even at home, listening uh, to the stories that come from us. Uh, you know, and it, it's uh, also, I think, would have pleased him tremendously for his book, you know, to be discussed in this sort of way. You know, my, my father, you know, he's he's more of a man of action than a man of letters. I think, even though he was a journalist and teacher and so on. You know, he, he did things. He's not one who's uh, somebody who sort of wrote about things too much, you know. Um, and I think uh, this is possibly uh, him, you know, in some ways plugging that particular gap 
with this sort of you know, co-authorship with John, I think, you know, and it's about his own story, he's contributing in some way to the intellectual landscape in, in, in Singapore. And, and I think that uh, that would have pleased him tremendously. And with such an esteemed panel, you know, Uncle Tommy, Tai Yong, and Minister George Hill, I mean, the three finest minds in Singapore discussing his story, that would have pleased him tremendously. So, you know, thank you all for coming. Thank you, panelists, for a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, discussion and, and, and mini speeches about your relationship with him and little nuggets of uh, personal anecdotes that, uh, you know, brought a lot of life to these proceedings. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Prakash. That's all the time we have for today's session. I'm sorry I can't take any more questions, but the family is here. So those of you who want to discuss the book with family, please feel free, yeah, please feel free to do so. There's a reception outside. Uh, I want to echo what uh, Prakash said about Ambassador Pele. He loves a good discussion. He loves a good debate. And I think he would be very pleased today to see how the ideas that he's conveyed in his book has been so vigorously talked about. So on that note, please join me in thanking my fellow panelists and thank you all for coming for today's event. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together again to thank the chairman, panelists, for an interesting and personal sharing of Ambassador Pillay's life journey with all of us. And I would also like to thank I would also like to thank, uh, thank Mr. Prakash Pillay for his speech. On behalf of ISIS, I would like to thank you for joining us and being part of a memorable afternoon. Just a gentle reminder, you can purchase a copy of Ambassador Pillay's memoirs at a very highly discounted price today, $50 net for the hardcover and $30 net for the paperback. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you at ISIS upcoming events. Thank you.